Hi, everyone, and welcome back to season eight of the podcast. I'm Louisa Dickens, your host of the podcast and co-founder of LMRE, the global prop tech recruitment and search consultancy. The aim of each episode is to introduce you to a prop tech innovator and discuss how their work has created a shift in focus when it comes to digitalizing the built environment. If you're interested in finding out more about prop tech or applying for a job in this space, or keen to know who the big players are that are moving and shaking the real estate industry, we have you covered. We'll be bringing you an episode each week to connect you to the VCs, prop tech startups, and real estate professionals from around the globe. Kevin from Navigator Cree, a product that simplifies the data management of your Cree data, and Frank from Padflip, which is solving the affordable housing issues through single and multifamily properties, are both chief operating officers. On this podcast, they share interesting insights on what a CEO does, the skills that are required, and why the role is so crucial for a company to scale and grow, and what the major challenges of this role are. A key takeaway from the episode is that hiring for growth is really challenging due to high demand mass skills shortage, and increased competition and retention struggles. In this episode, we name check Brad Hargreaves from Common as we are talking about co-living in relation to Pathfit. We did an episode with Brad where we talked about Common and recent M&A in the space in season seven. So please check the show notes for a link to that if you want to take a listen. Enjoy. Now, today we are joined by two of my US friends. We've got Frank, the CEO of Padlet, and Kevin, the CEO of Navigator Cree. And we will be discussing the importance of the role of a CEO in the growth of a startup business. So obviously, you've been talked about it then. These two will also touch upon a few other hot topics, like obviously affordable housing. I mean, that goes into Padlet and obviously BI. And then we're also going to be chatting through and gossiping about all the M&A that's happening as well and what that means for other businesses in our space. So without further ado, welcome to the show, Frank and Kevin. Thanks so much for having me. Appreciate it. Yeah, excited to be on. I think it's time to let our guests talk about their journey. So without further ado, Frank, I'd love to hear about your journey. Now, we spoke about it briefly before we pressed the record button, and you've served, obviously, in the U.S. Marine Corps. You've worked, obviously, at leading consultancy McKinsey. You're now the CEO of Padlet. How did this all come about? And then we can obviously go into a bit more about what Padlet does and, you know, what problem it solves in the affordable housing space, which is, you know, a problem globally. So why don't you kick us off? Yeah, how did I get here? That's the good one. I really uh, I figured out haphazardly, I think, I, as, as with most people. Yeah, definitely several years in the Marine Corps infantry, deployed a couple of times to Afghanistan several years ago. Then, yeah, moved to London, you know, worked for McKinsey and ultimately, you know, kind of bounced back and forth between several different things. And I always, you know, I've always had a lot of interest. And I think that's part of why I actually enjoy consulting in a lot of ways that you work on a lot of different things. It can, mm. you know, be a different industry, different product all the time, you know, every couple months or every couple of weeks. And yeah, I'd actually left McKinsey as we were having children and took a job at Georgia Pacific. My wife wanted to go back to work. And, you know, I traded a lot of hours in diversity for, you know, being in general management, I was promptly very bored. And my brother-in-law, Atticus, who's our CEO, he's always been in real estate. It's like, oh, you know, I'd invested in projects with him for years. And obviously I've been married to his sister for 11 years. So I've, uh, you know, kind of know him quite a bit, but, uh, you know, I'm, I'm working on this, this thing, this thing's been kicking around in the back of my head, this room rental model. I know that it works. I've done it on properties before. And, you know, it just like, I'm kind of bored too. You know, he started, you know, several kind of successful real estate companies and had more or less handed off the day to day. And frankly, I was at the point where it's like, oh, you know, I'm, I'm bored. I'm looking for a challenge. Let me, let me do this as a side hustle too. And, and so we started on it and started kind of growing it from there. And it sort of just started gaining momentum. We started gaining customers and, you know, all of a sudden we we're like, okay, well, I think I need to quit my job. I think we need to do this full time or maybe there's, there's something there. And, you know, that was about three and a half, four years ago. And we've grown since then. We have 117 folks. We're in, you know, most of the sort of the Southeast and West. End. And while that seems like we've grown a ton, boy, has it been, uh, there's been struggles along the way, as I'm sure you can imagine. But what we do at our core is we're a marketplace platform. So think like Airbnb, but instead of being fractional in terms of time, so one short-term rental, one short-term rental, we're fractional in terms of space. So it's renting by the room. So what we do is we work with landlords, as we call them hosts, to capture and monetize underutilized space within 
their rental properties, right, within their assets. And some of the, there were kind of a couple core insights that got us started down this path. One is for a particular kind of asset, you know, one that's larger, one that has a little bit more space, that extra space is a liability. The extra space costs you more for your room terms. You don't get paid for it, right? You don't get paid to have extra square footage in a rental, really. But when you rent by the room, for those bedrooms are your revenue generating units. You do increase your revenue. So you can generate significantly higher yields. And as asset prices have appreciated and yields have been compressed, that's just been more and more important. And the other insight is that, you know, you kind of mentioned it. There's everywhere I go, oh, you know, Frank, the thing is here in Cincinnati and Las Vegas and LA, wherever, we have an affordable housing challenge. Yeah, yeah, and no, I hear it. But the fact is they're right. I mean, it is, it is everywhere. And our view is that if you can make affordable housing higher return than mm. market rate, what you're doing today, there is no affordable housing challenge because you're leveraging the capital and energy and intellect of the private investor and yeah. they are motivated to solve yeah. that. So how do you make it, you know, without subsidy, without lie tech and tax credits and all the complication, how do you make creating truly affordable units high yield? And if you can do that, that's the hard part, obviously. I guess we'll talk about it a bit later because obviously within the co-living space, there's not too many players left. I know common that's a couple of acquisitions, but I'd love to hear a bit more about your growth. There's been a huge amount of it. Obviously, it's lucky enough to meet your brother-in-law, Atticus, which was just telling me all the good things that you guys have achieved. So we'll talk about that sort of a bit later. But Kevin, obviously it's fantastic doing a podcast with you. It seems every time I see you at the Marguerite in hand at a conference, after drinks and I'm not complaining. Let's have, you know, more of a professional conversation. Talk us through your journey to PropTech. So very similar to Frank, you've worked for obviously a leading consultancy, um, but you've also done obviously investment banking and more with Stanley, EY Deloitte, like I mentioned. Now, Navigator, talk us through that. And then talk us through also Navigator is a, you know, it's a business intelligence platform. You know, not all the audience knows what that exactly means. I'm still struggling to learn about all these different technologies in the market. So tell us about your journey and tell us about your business. Yeah. Thanks for having me on. I will attempt uh, to explain my journey quickly and <laughs> keep the focus off of uh, clearly my habit of imbibing <laughs> during the day at these conferences to keep it exciting. So I've spent the last 17 years in commercial real estate. You mentioned a few of the companies, a state investment banking, then an MBA during the financial crisis, very lucky timing. And then almost 10 years in management consulting focused specifically in the real estate technology group before my most recent role before I became COO of Navigator was leading a group of people in our real estate technology group globally. And that brought me up on stage at a lot of conferences and events. It put me in a lot of different geographies. So I got to meet with owners, operators, investors, managers across all property types and all geographies and hear about their problems. And the most consistent problem I got was we've got a bunch of information that we don't use to make decisions because it's spread out all over the place. It's almost like what Frank's company has done with space we are doing with information and data. Mm. So we're bringing all of the financial, operational, market, demographic, et cetera. And we centralize all of it in our data warehouse, which is where we store all the information, both historically and up-to-date dynamically. Then we integrate all the information together and create visual outputs so that people that aren't necessarily very technology savvy can understand the information and make decisions a lot faster than they would have normally, right? So when, a, when an executive asks a question about asset performance or acquisition pipeline or lease velocity or aged receivables or where store or who to rent to or when to use or not use ESG tech or what amenities to add to a space, all of those decisions in the past have required a bunch of prep meetings. And we try to eliminate a lot of that by having all the data at the ready so that executives can make decisions a lot faster. Yeah, and I think that's what everyone sort of wants. Always these deals seem to go on forever and ever. When you say a lot faster, what sort of time frame are you sort of looking at then? In a, I'll call it the future state, once all the <laughs> are complete and all the use cases are defined, everything's visualized, like the end state is often in order of magnitude improvement. So if something is taking two months to go through an approval process and get approved and all that, we're trying to get that done in less than a week. We do that because all of the information across department, across system, across geography is at the ready. And I think everyone saw this firsthand when COVID happened. 
when you were less able to travel to see each other in different markets in the office and able to collaborate face to face, it accelerated the necessity of having data in a place where everybody could access it regardless of where they were, when they were, who they were. Hi, I'm Nelson from Property Quants. We are on a hands-on, in-depth course that will teach you to apply data science and machine learning to real estate. To learn more, visit propertyquants.com slash training. We also run a revolutionary course that will allow anyone to gain data science skills without needing to learn programming. To learn more about that, visit thenocodecourse.com. On either side, be sure to key in the code LMRE5 for a special 5% discount. For you, obviously, you describe your sort of product there. We all need to talk about what your roles are within your businesses as well. I mean, you both have very integral roles to the growth. You both have products, which just learned about now. Your product is nothing about, obviously, the C-suite and obviously the wider team. Now, I've mentioned earlier, I've been on a couple of calls talking about the important and the role of a COO and two clients which I'm trying to hire that role for. And they both gave me very different descriptions of what they think that person does and looks like and the skills they should have. And you both have obviously very impressive track record, CVs, everything like that. So Frank, what would you say are the key skills that make a good COO? You know, how did you, I guess, get into that role? What makes a successful COO? Yeah, it's a great question. I, I think it depends a little bit on the organization. In the most general sense, to me, a COO's role is an execution one, right? The mm-hmm. CEO and the board, to a large extent, your shareholders are setting the vision, setting the priorities, and the COO's job is to execute on them. Now, obviously, there's a give and take there and a refining, a bottom refinement, kind of top down sort of vision and directives that should hopefully be informed certainly by data and experience and the unfortunate real world learnings of having your previous plans be interrupted by real life. Now, the way that you do that, and obviously I kind of started as the COO of pad split when we had two people, there wasn't a whole lot of that then. I think then executing meant, you know, mopping the floors or cleaning the toilets or whatever, whatever needed to be done. But, you know, when I think about how you do that as an organization grows, I think the key skill and maybe the hardest one for a lot of organizations, especially growing ones and ones that are developing kind of new products and new technologies and new industries is having really great metrics and being able to actually know what's important, understand how those metrics actually tie into day to day and which ones drive great performance. You know, anyone can do really high level metrics, but you know, that's, it's tautological. Of course we want top line growth. How do we get there? Okay. Well, that means we need more sales with uh, at higher volume. Okay, well, fine. But like, how do we, how do we get there? Then also you can actually measure. I mean, that's another issue that many people in certainly startups, but in all companies run into where we can measure everything these days. I mean, data is so much more accessible. You know, everyone has their dashboards and you can run queries and, and all that. But there's all sorts of things that you can measure that you can't control or you can measure, but it's based off assumptions because people are going to have to enter the data and they're easy to work. Mm-hmm. So really being, and that takes just really intimate knowledge with the business and the processes to say, okay, well, if I'm thinking, I mean, I spent almost all my time really on the supply side of our business. I've fortunately been able to offload much on the, the sort of resident side. But, you know, when I look at our sales cycle and our sales process and how that bill becomes a law, so to speak, You know, it's easy to say, okay, well, we'll measure this in our CRM and we'll know when this opportunity hits and when it goes to this stage and well, all well and good. But you think, well, but I've done that before and I know how that happens and I understand how the sales rep is thinking about and how the the customer is thinking about it and how the data gets entered. And I can't use this metric because it'll be really easy to tweak. And that's actually not what we're trying to improve. You know, it's, it's sort of a derived, you know, glamour metric. So all that to say, I mean, it's about having this kind of really abstracted view of how the machine works, but that's deeply informed by the real world challenges of how that actually operates so that you can an abstracted view. You know, anyone can build a model, but can you build a model where the abstractions are correct and relevant? So that's what I think it works, whether or not we actually, (laughs) that's what I'd like for it to be. Kevin, what about you? What do you think makes a COA? What makes you good at your job? Well, similar to Frank, I, when I joined Navigator SEO, I was employee number 10. Now we're 52. And with the wonderful help of Elmari, we're planning on growing a lot. 
hopefully doubling to 100 employees next year. And that requires processes that can scale. I really think at the end of the day, the, the job of the COO is to help a company scale efficiently. And there's a lot of ways to do that, right? You know, there's like Frank mentioned tracking everything in a CRM. To me, my role is hybrid. So I oversee our sales team and our operations team. And to a certain degree, our fundraising effort as we continue to raise capital. And what I found is the most important role of the COO is finding lieutenants, right? The, the VP level people that are one level below who are running their own teams efficiently and reporting mm. up to me. And that's the biggest change in going from 10 employees to 50 is that extra layer of, of scale. And to Frank's earlier point about tracking KPIs, you need to determine which KPIs actually matter to your business. For us, we are trying to convince owners, operators, investors, occupiers, and managers of commercial real estate, all of their information on our platform. And that takes a lot of effort. And so the first thing we had to do was segment the market. Who are going to be our most long-term profitable customers, right? Is it a large company? Is it a small company? Is it an integrated company? Is it a diversified company? Is it a focused company? Is it local? Is it global, right? We, we had to segment the market by type, persona, property type, geography, et cetera. Then we had to hone all of the messaging that goes out to each of those different persona groups in various mediums. So the COO hat really is the CEO of execution. I truly think that the CEO's job is strategic in nature and they're spreading the gospel of the company with various audiences, clients, regulators, competitors even, and the COO has to go execute. But what I've found at Navigator is we're kind of two in a box and we're both operating in both roles to get things done and preach the gospel and the vision. And mm. I've seen that at a lot of technology companies where you have a handful of people at the top who all have various C-level titles and you are sharing roles as they grow and figure out who's best at what role. Yeah. Hey, this is Michael Beckerman from Cretech. I'm here to invite you to check out Cretech Plus the first streaming platform devoted to innovation and technology in the built world, featuring new weekly videos from the world's leading real estate and tech professionals. The first month of streaming is absolutely free, and then you could use the code LMRE to receive 25% off your second month. To learn more, visit plus.cretech.com. Going back to your point about finding your number two, so you can go from say 10 to 50 to obviously a hundred, like your sort of plans are. We've come through something very similar, LMRE, fine, we're not selling a product, we're selling a career, but those have been some of our hardest hires to do, but then sort of manage and then obviously put in all the training to ensure that they are managing and developing their team below them. It takes a lot of work and I don't think people realize how much time it takes as well. But when you've got that base team, those managers, you can then like continue the growth, then you're off to a great start. Now on a podcast, obviously we'd love to like gossip a little bit. We've obviously been reading in the news with its real deal, Creator, Prop Motor, you name it. And there's been a lot of prop tech acquisitions, whether it's been Office App, Rise, Lane, Building Engines, mostly not to mention WeWorks IPO. What do you guys think is going to happen to the next year? Kevin, would love to hear from you first, particularly in relevant to sort of pubs where, you know, Brad's sort of common bought, uh, I think it's Ollie and previously that, but I think Ollie bought Star City. So what does that mean? Relevant to you, surely these acts are just good things. It means there's a great market for it. People want to buy. And so Kevin, why don't you kick us off? I think a few trends that we saw in 2021 are absolutely going to continue in 22. You'll see continued consolidation among product firms. And that's just a sign of any industry starting to, I think COVID highlighted some fast growing companies and exposed ones that, that weren't quite ready for this change to hybrid work. And that's caused a lot of acquisitions. Mm -hmm. I think you'll continue to see more IPOs because 2022 is going to mark the end of the, the clock for all of those SPACs that launched in the like mid to late 2020 yeah. craze, they all have 24 month windows to deploy the capital. So you're going to see, I think a lot of SPAC activity in 2022. I think this new, everyone's calling it digital transformation that used to be a sexy and unknown term. That's now just standard. And most of the companies that are coming to these prop tech conferences, they've already 
drank the Kool-Aid. They're on board to change to a more digital format. And then I think the last, there's going to be some sort of reckoning on what ESG actually means and where it actually matters to a real estate company. It's a sexy term. People want to talk about it a lot in public, but how is it actually going to make a real estate company more profitable, have higher brand value, provide better tenant experience? ESG has been a very de rigueur term. Everyone wants to talk about ESG and how they're changing their business to be more environmentally responsible, socially responsible, have better corporate governance. The question in 2022 is going to be, what KPIs do you measure to justify the ROI of focusing on ESG? Like we're coming out of what was an uncertain time in COVID. And now I think people are focusing on different things because they're feeling better about their business. The question will be, where is ESG worth investing in? And where is it going to be profitable both for a real estate company and for a real estate company's brand? And where is it more just marketing fluff that's hard mm. to back up with numbers? Yeah. The go back to, I guess, two points you made there. Obviously, you mentioned about, I guess, the real estate by drinking the Kool-Aid. I love that expression. So American, I love it. But yeah, more of these heads of innovation, they're, they're all being hired and they're all asking, you know, obviously, Elmore, you make these hires, but we are getting more and more mandates for these, these heads of transformation, digitalizations, integration people as well, because they now are using your products. They need to make sure their business are actually using them properly and making use of them. And then there's also going back to the ESG point. I saw Matt Ellis from Measurable wrote a little article about these new hires we made in the ESG space, like it's not like a COO, but it's basically a head of water for these businesses and a head of carbon, I think for this. CC, I can't, I can't remember exactly the new title, but all some of these real estate businesses are now making these hires to really understand and make sure they're tracking the ESG and the reporting and everything like that. So yeah, lots to come in that space. Frank, what's your whole opinion on all this M&A and how it may or may not affect, you know, pad splits? It, surely it's quite exciting. Sure. Well, I, I suppose, I guess it's binary if it's exciting or not, but I agree with Kevin uh, wholeheartedly. And I think he's absolutely right. I mean, we're going to, I think, see a ton of activity in 2022. I can't see him. There's just too much, too much capital out there. It needs to be deployed. It will be going. No, I mean, I do think we're going to see some very public failures that will be high in people's minds. And I'm not saying, oh, for this company or that company, but just in the mm. fact that because it involves where people live, there's a lot of sensitivity to it, maybe outsized relative to when, say, a SaaS startup goes down or, or this or that. You could see it a little, I mean, WeWork is going to IPO, obviously, at a much uh, lower valuation than they raised that. Mm -hmm. But, you know, it's very public because a lot of people had a connection to the brand, its physical space. And they're definitely, as with all kind of speculative ventures, there are going to be some whiffs, right? And co-living is a particularly interesting space. There was a ton of buzz in it. There were some acquisitions, but none of those were big exits. They were consolidations for companies that really, really struggled with COVID. And in some ways with the kind of long-term lease liabilities that also kind of bedeviled WeWork. So a lot of it was kind of perhaps a little uh, structural exuberance with some of those business models that hopefully won't impact us. We're not really structured that way, but I certainly foresee a lot of activity I think there will be some consolidation. I mean, everyone's kind of racing for scale with a lot of these mm. things. So it just takes an inordinate amount of capital to create scale of assets. I mean, you look at kind of institutional SFR space, you know, that'll be no different for co-living or anything else for people who want to own the assets. So I undoubtedly, I think we'll see another record-breaking year in terms of M&A activity and exits and, and so on, even if there are some very public failures throughout. Yeah. Well, yeah. Let's see what happens in 2022. This is going to come out a little bit later, maybe in the new year. I don't know exactly what podcast you have planned, but everybody's listening. We're recording this. It's early December and we're all sort of gearing up for maybe Mepin, but we don't know if we're all going to be able to travel. But we're all looking forward to um, 2022, which hopefully will be a massive year for Navigator Cree and Pad Split. Did you know that the average cost of making a bad hire in the real estate market is £60,000? Or if you're listening to us from the US, that's US dollars Finding out an employee is moving on is never great news, but sadly, it's unavoidable. The cost of hiring so high, it's important to get it right the first time round. 
So if you're struggling to find the right candidates, why not consider working with a recruitment agency? We're experts at finding the right people to fill roles. And because we already have a database to hand, we can speed up the process too. So head to lmre.tech to brief us on your next hire. And now we have come nearly to the end of the podcast. We've got the final part, which is the LMRE part. So L, lessons learned in their career. M, as Chancellor Frank, Kevin, to give anyone or a product or service a shout out. R, which is what is the most rewarding part of working in this space. And E, were they most excited about? And um, so, Kevin, do you want to run us through your four answers? Oh, wow. You know, lessons I've learned this year, like in 2021, events matter. Face-to-face relationship building has only been highlighted during COVID as for us as a technology mm. provider, but just as social humans, being able to shake someone's hand and, you know, share a meal or a conversation, it just adds so much value. And what I've found is that where we've had the best relationships, especially with other technology players out there, is they have the same feeling, this more open and collaborative nature of companies wanting to integrate with each other and partner together and go to market together has been really helpful. We've had a handful of companies in the acquisition space that's deal path. That's been, you know, mainly Yardi and MRI in the leasing space that's been BTS and, and dotted. And there's like countless other companies that we love partnering and integrating with because our clients already use them. And then what was the last piece you want to be the most rewarding part? And what are you most excited about? Oh, what am I most excited about? An acceleration of the trends we're already seeing. That's the excitement. I think yeah. there'll be more events. There'll be bigger events. There'll be a ton of acceleration in the adoption of prop tech. The acquisition activity is just going to make the industry more exciting for everybody. Anytime there are exits, people get excited. And so I think just the energy level in general is going to be really intense in 2022. For my greatest fear, finding talent as you grow is still so hard. And that's what keeps me up at night. Yeah, me too, Kevin. Well, yeah, anyone who's looking for a job or hiring, shout out to Ella Murray. Also, Kevin, going back to your point about importance of in-person events, I've had a few conversations with people who've been asking, how were they? And I've always, obviously, I think the ones which went at Blueprint were wonderful. It's awesome in Vegas. Michael's ones in New York and London were so important to meeting people, shaking hands, confirming, obviously, the relationship, understanding people. I think there's still such a need for them. I don't think it's going to be getting all digital. And I question people that do think there won't be a place for them. So, yeah, I completely agree with you. There's so much excitement and hopefully... As more people enter this space, this excitement's only going to grow. Now, Frank, time for you to finish us off with obviously your lessons learned. Anyone you want to give a shout out to a product of oh, what's the most rewarding part and e, what do you miss and excited about in the future of PropTech? Well, of course, Kevin stole a really good lesson about the importance of in-face meetings. So, you know, with that aside, <laughs> for me, the lesson, not that it's a new one, I, I think it's kind of an internal one, but just is so mm-hmm. important is that your integrity lowers your cost of capital. And, you know, real estate has always had a charlatans, God knows, uh, startups and ventures, you know, the fake it till you make it is, uh, <laughs> is, is basically part of the gospel. It doesn't mean you'll deliver on all your promises. Sometimes you'll fall short. But if you try, if you're an honest broker in your dealings, and I, I mean, in a small B, you know, non-real estate broker sense, you gain people's trust. And if you can do that, you know, getting capital is, is easy. You know, getting capital is straightforward. People trust you and trust you with it. So I'm not much for career advice, maybe. But if I were, that would be kind of lesson number one for people. And certainly for me, and something I try and keep in mind. For mention, it has nothing to do with prop tech, but my wife's startup, Jojo Learning, is all about raising your children in a bilingual world, teaching children a, a second language. Our children become fluent in Mandarin 100% through my wife's very hard work. And so she works incredibly, incredibly hard. It is a labor of love for her. So I always have to give her and, and her team a shout out. Oh. For that. Everyone should check it out even before you go to padsplit.com. So very important. As far as the rewarding aspect for me, I mean, there's definitely the aspect with, with customers that is just really transformational when either I see, you know, we, we talked a little bit about ESG metrics and I, I tend to be a, a touch cynical on it because I, I think a lot of it is kind of a fluff to sell to your LPs and, you know, you can change them every week and no one cares as long as there's a thing. Whereas I look at our business and say, you know, for me, uh, the number of units that we have that are available at 
$600 when a, an apartment is 1000, that's the, that's the ESG metric, right? If we have a hundred thousand, it's a thousand times better, you know, kind of thing. But at the human level, you know, to see our residents are cut from the, the crooked timber of humanity and they fall short sometimes, right? They err, but you know, certainly you see folks who really, really works and they're able to save money and kind of move up the housing continuum and these things that, you know, can be difficult for folks. So seeing that, even if it doesn't work every time, mm -hmm. seeing it happen, kind of increasingly happen at scale is really rewarding. Also just people on my team who have now been with us a couple of years where they've really kind of grown and developed yeah. and is now like a badass sales rep. Like this is awesome. You know, they really kind yeah. of moving around. Yeah. And then as far as what I'm excited about in the future of prop tech, it's just that, you know, I do feel we're just on the cusp of so many interesting things because it is a really untapped industry. It's very old school. I mean, and across the board, whether it's certainly anything that touches the regulatory side, oh my God, is it antiquated and slow? Certainly anything on the, and that pervades everything, but construction techniques I and mean, the way you frame up a house now, isn't that different from when you, how you framed up a house a hundred years ago? There's a whole lot of stuff there and that obviously, and then kind of moving on to sort of creative financing and data and, and everything else. So there's just a whole lot there that it, just so much opportunity that will hit next month and next year and, and so on. So just kind of watching it grow and evolve. And it, I, I think what people don't appreciate sometimes is that people spend about 30% of their income on housing. It's just such an important part of our lives and such a huge share of our wallet that U.S. single family homes is the largest asset class in the world. So it doesn't need to be an enormous change to be an enormous impact. Anyway, it's just, I, I think it's maybe overdue, but maybe we're there. Awesome. Thank you very much for that, Frank. And obviously Kevin too. It's been a pleasure having you both on the podcast. I'm very excited to see how both your businesses grow and develop in the next year. And hopefully, Kevin, I will see you next week in person. And um, obviously, Frank, maybe in 2022, we will finally uh, grab a drink as well. But thank you for joining the show. And I'm looking forward to catching up with you after the podcast. Thanks for having us on. Thanks so much. Thank you for joining us this week on the PropCast and a big thanks to our guests and our sponsors, Cretech and Reentech. Make sure you visit our website, lmre.tech, where you can subscribe to our newsletter, keep up with our industry news and events, or if you're looking for your next career move, it's all on there. The PropCast can be found on iTunes, Spotify, and YouTube, where all good content is found. Whilst you're at it, if you found value in the show, we'd appreciate it if you could spread the word and tell a friend about it, or even write us a review. And I'll catch you next week. Making a high quality podcast like this takes a lot of work. That's a fact. But not when you hire Copus. With our white glove experience, we handle everything for you. From guest outreach all the way through to publishing and promotion, we handle it all. You show up to hold great interviews and build relationships with your guests, and we take care of everything else. Podcasting is not just about the audience. Every podcast interview is the start of a new relationship. With a weekly podcast, you would build relationships with 52 ideal partners or prospects through your podcast interviews over the next 12 months. Do you believe that 52 new relationships would grow your business? We do. Contact Jason at copus, K-O-P-U-S dot com and let's talk. Music.